Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it's a great honor to be uh, joining you tonight, uh, the eve of Yom Ashura, um, and to speak about uh, the important events and lessons of what is known as the uh, Al Karbala or the the murder of Imam Hussein. Uh, but of course, before doing that, I think it's important to uh, create a context, you know, and to, because ultimately, to, in order to reap the full benefits of such lessons, you need to understand, one, uh, something of the history of Yom Ashura and what it meant in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before the celebration of Ashura or the commemoration of Ashura was connected uh, to the events that happened at, at Karbala. And we know the word uh, at Karbala is a compound word which is com it combines the uh, words Karb with Bala, which Karb means distress and Bala, tribulation. But Yom al-Ashura, the 10th of the month of Muharram, the first month of the Islamic New Year, uh, during the time of the Prophet Wasallam, when he was in Mecca, it was a day that he fasted. It was a day that the mushrikeen in Mecca, they also fasted this day. Uh, now the sources, Islamic sources, don't give us any clarity on why uh, the mushrikeen were fasting on Ashura, other than that uh, there was some apparent sin that the Quraysh had collectively committed on that day. And so uh, out of uh, a sort of penance for that sin, uh, inherited from their forefathers, they fasted that day as a source of repentance, of tawbah from that sin. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu um, fasted that day as well. It's not completely clear why he fasted it. Perhaps the reason that they fasted it, uh, to be more precise, was because they were just simply following the church tradition of Ibrahim alayhi salam, that the, the, what had been passed down to them from the time of Ibrahim Salam, even though, of course, we can't confirm that, but we do know that it was a fast in Mecca that the Prophet had, he, had, um, he continued. And then when he moved to Medina, uh, the Prophet Salam, he found and discovered that the Jews of Medina were fasting Yom Ashura as well. So he asked him, well, why are you fasting this day? And he was surprised you know, to find them fasting that day. So they said, well, this day we fasted because it was the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he saved the children of Israel from Pharaoh and he drowned the forces of Pharaoh. And Musa alayhi salam, he fasted it, shukran illah, out of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what he had done to him, to him and to his people. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, responded to them saying, nahnu ahaqqu wa awla bi Musa minkum, that we are more entitled and more suited for Moses than you are. So he fasted it and he ordered the companions to fast the day of Ashura. In other words, that this had become the very first obligatory fast in Islam, the day of Ashura. And this is after the Prophet ﷺ had moved to Medina. Now, once the fast of Ramadan became an obligation, the Prophet ﷺ, he was given information or told that um, Ashura would no longer be compulsory because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had replaced the day of Ashura for the, for the month of Ramadan, for fasting, as a pillar of Islam. And the Prophet وسلم, despite this, he continued to fast Ashura and he, he encouraged the companions to continue to fast. Uh, and then during the last year of his life, the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, um, he, uh, because of hostilities that developed between the Muslims and the Jews in Medina, uh, and the fact that the, the Jews would constantly say when they found Muslims doing things similar to themselves, they, oh, they're just copying us, right? So the Prophet ﷺ, so he wanted to send a strong message to them and he made a statement, public statement that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me life until next year, then I will also fast at Tasu'a or at Tasa, the ninth of, uh, of Muharram, which is today, the ninth of, of, of Muharram, in other words, I fast the ninth along with the tenth, right? So it became a sunnah from that time, even though the Prophet himself never had got the, received the opportunity to do that because he died before the, the, the next Ashura. 
Uh, but the companions, they fasted uh, the ninth and the tenth uh, and fulfilled, uh, complied with the commandment of the Prophet ﷺ to khalif al Yahud to be different from the Jews with respect to the fast of Ashura. Um, and then there are multiple hadith which state that the Prophet encouraged not only to fast the day before Ashura, but the day after it as well. So there were some in the Muslim history who also fasted the, the 11th, right? So they would fast the ninth of Ashura, the tenth of Ashura, and then the 11th of Ashura. Now, a Muharram is, is also just a very blessed month. It is one of the Ashur Hurram. It is the, the sanctified months or the, uh, the holy months of, of Islam. And this is four months that Allah, he, he, he declared to be um, sacred from the time that the heavens and the earth were created, right? And Al Muharram happens to be among, among them. So the entire month is blessed, right? It is a day where the good, good deeds are multiplied and magnified Good, bad deeds are also magnified during this month. And this was also a month which gave an opportunity to those who were traveling to Mecca for Hajj to return home without fear that they would be killed. So that was one of the other rules, that if it's one of the Ashur Huram, that fighting was prohibited. Right? So, so it is a blessed period that we're still in. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us opportunities. In other words, Ashura uh, has been connected with the the rescue of the children of Israel from Pharaoh, it was is connected to um, a sin or a sunnah of the mushrikeen of fashion connected to some event that happened prior to the, uh, to the obligation of the fast of Ashura. Uh, and then also it has been said that Yom Ashura is the day uh, that the Ark of Noah السلام, had settled upon the mount. Mustawad al Judi, it mentioned in the Quran, you know, that it became settled upon mountain al Judi. Some say the mountain of Ararat was found in Anatolia, which is modern day Turkey, right? And, um, and so, so to celebrate for multiple reasons, right? Uh, but again, the beginning of years uh, should bring us back to a reminder, a reminder of the importance of our own beginnings, our own origin story as well. Um, it, is said that, it is said that this day, Ashura, is also the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forgave Adam alayhi salam. Tiba alayhi fihi, tiba fihi ala Adam. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forgave Adam on this day, Yom Ashura. Right? And so we are here on this earth temporarily for a very short time. Right? Our true home is Jannah. And this is something understood from a very, very long time in the Muslim history. That, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being for Jannah. Just unfortunately, many of us may not make it there. Iyadu billah. Right? And even po po poems have been written in this regard. There's one po poet who said, Fahiyya ila jannati adnin fa innaha manaziru kal ula wa fiha al mukhayyamu. So, so, say, so hasten to the Garden of Eden because it is your original home. And that is the place of residence. It said that, but however, we are in the clutches of the enemy. We are captives of the enemy, shaitan. Right? So do you think that we will return to our homeland and then experience safety once again? So, so, so they understood this to be the case. When the Prophet ﷺ, he uh, had his Isra Mi'raj and he met Ibrahim alayhi salam. It's related that Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said to the Prophet, Ya, Rasul, ya Muhammad, he said, Ya Muhammad, aqra ala ummatika as salam. He said, Deliver my greetings to your ummah. We, 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 deliver my greetings to your ummah. Faqul lahum, inna janna jannata abbatul ma. He said, And tell them, and let them know. That Jannah has sweet water. Tayyibat al turba. It is rich in soil. Ghirasuha wa ghirasuha, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. He said that, and know that the, the, the source of his crops, or the seeds for his crops, are those words of subhanallah, walhamdulillah. Wala ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. So here in this, in this world, we take seeds of, of avocados or seeds for 
whatever, right? Any type of fruit or, or thing that we, that we love to eat, right? And then they grow. But in that world, the seeds for growth and the expansion of our estates is these special words, among other things. Among other things. Imam Hassan al-Basri, he said that the angels, every single day and every single moment of the day, that they are building and expanding our estates in Jannah. And at certain times, they just stop working altogether. And then someone calls out to them saying, um, why have you stopped? And their response is, Hatta na'tiyana and nafaqat. We're, made, we're waiting for more funds. We're waiting for more funds to come. And when more funds come, then we will continue our work. And what they meant by that is the funds of good deeds, of your prayers, of your charity, of your, uh, your, your supplications, right? Your goodwill to others, your humility, all those things, right? That itself, they're the seeds to grow the crops of all the good fruits and other things that you receive, inshallah, in Jannah. So, so again, just, to, just a little bit about like the history or the, what the meaning of Ashura, right, in the life of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, before we even come to the events of Imam al Hussein, radiallahu an. Now, reflecting on the, the assassination of Imam Hussein, we know that he was killed unjustly and killed in a very gruesome manner along with um, scores of his family members and, and, his, and his disciples during the day of al shura the year 61 of the Hijra. Um, um Salama, Rajul Anha, one of the wives of the Prophet وسلم, she said she had a dream. And this is after Imam Hussein had headed for Kufa, Karbala. He had set out. And he had a, she had a dream that she saw the Prophet وسلم, she came to her in a dream. He came to her in a dream. And she noticed, she saw that the Prophet وسلم, was, his hair was disheveled. It was covered with dust. Right? He, he, he was in a sense, a state of, of, of sadness at the moment. And so she asked him, Ya Rasulullah, what is this? What, what happened? Why are you this way? And in her dream, he tells her, I just saw the murder of Hussein. This is before his actual murder. Right? She had this dream. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he also had a dream prior to the, the murder of Hussein. And in his dream, he saw the Prophet as well, alayhi salatu wasalam. And he also noticed the Prophet وسلم, was not himself, right? Hair disheveled, covered with dirt, dirt as well. And, and he noticed that he was, he was on the ground, he was as if he was wiping something up off the ground. And he's collecting blood that he was picking off the ground and putting it inside of a bottle, a container. And then the Prophet وسلم, Ya Rasulullah, what is this? What are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm collecting the blood of Hussein and his disciples. I've been doing this since earlier in the morning. I've been doing this all day. And then Ibn Abbas, he said, and once we got word of Imam Hussein's, his murder, we did a calculation from the time I had that, that dream until then we noticed that they had that dream on the very day that Imam Hussein actually was killed. Actually, it was the same day that he was killed. That, that, dream, that dream, a dream happened. They were not aware, the Sahaba weren't aware of it yet. Right? Those, those, in, those in Medina, like Ibn Abbas. He said, we collect, calculated the time. He said, oh, that was the very same day that I had this dream. Now, before getting into the events leading up to that, um, I think that a couple of lessons that come out of reflection upon uh, Imam Hussein and the Ali Bayt, the family of the Prophet his household, is the importance that Islam has given to the love of Ahlul Bayt or the, the household of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. Doesn't mean you're Shiite to be one who loves the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam or to love the, the, the household of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. We know that Sunnis as well, we have the tradition. As a matter of fact, every single Salat that we pray, we not only pray for ourselves, but we also pray for 
Rasulullah we actually we send our send him our, our salutations. Wa salatu alayka ayyuhan nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, uh, 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 peace and mercy and blessing be upon you, O Messenger, Messenger of Allah. Right? We, we pray and we extend in our salutations to the Prophet Sallallahu in our prayers. But we also ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to bless Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. As he has blessed Ibrahim and the Ali of Ibrahim. So these are people who already have a very special status with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. I mean, think about Zayd ibn Haritha, for instance, Rajallahu An. The only Sahabi who is mentioned by name in the Quran. Zayd ibn Haritha has a very special status. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to put his name in his eternal book, right? Uh, connected to an incident that happened in the time of the Messenger, that he's the only one mentioned by name. There are many verses we know that this verse was related to Abu Bakr, this, this was Umar, this was this Sahabi. We know that. But none of them are mentioned by name in the Quran. Zayd ibn Haritha is mentioned, mentioned, in, the, mentioned in the Quran. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he willed it that the family, the household of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, that their memory be eternalized uh, in our history, but also by the very fact that we pray for them, right? Every single prayer that we make when we are doing tahiyyat and the salat Ibrahimiyyah, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim that we have that already in, uh, part, of, part of what we, what we know. And we also know as well that the Prophet ﷺ, in a hadith, very famous hadith, they mentions that, تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ شَيْئِينَ There are two things I have left you with, لَن تَدِلُّوا مَا تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا That you would never go astray as long as you cling to them. And the more popular narration says, كِتَابُ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّتِي the book of Allah and my, and, my, and my sunnah. And another narration, the hadith is Sahih narration too. He mentions Kitab Allah wa Ishrati. He said, the book of Allah and my family, my household, the members of my household. Now there was a, a, a day called Ahlul Kisa. After the verse in Surah Al Hazab was revealed, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that Allah, He desires to remove all impurities from you, O oh, members of the household, household, that He wants to uh, remove all impurities from you and to purify you completely. Right? That when this verse was revealed, the Prophet وسلم, He gathered together Imam Hassan. And Hussein, these were these little, they're little boys. They're, they're, the Prophet ﷺ, when he died, والسلام, Imam Hussein was probably about seven years old. Imam al Hassan was probably about five. But the Prophet ﷺ, he brought them together into a, a cloak that he was wearing. And he told Fatima to come to him. And he sat her between his legs. And then he called Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. And then he wrapped them all in this cloak. And then he recited this verse. So to indicate to the Muslims that these were very special people. These were his, his, his family. Um, he, he talked about how if Fatima, if someone makes Fatima angry, then it makes him angry too. Right? That, that, uh, that said, Hussein is part of me and I am part of Hussein. Right? Uh, uh, the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu when he spoke about Imam Ali Imam Abi Talib, he said, uh, he mentioned in the day of Ghadir Khum, uh, which um, is often spoken about with regard to the dispute about who the leadership be given to. He mentioned, he made a prayer for Ali, Allahumma wadi man walahu wa adi man adah, O Allah, be an ally to anyone he's an ally to and be an enemy to anyone who's an enemy of his. Right, so, so they have a special status, right? Um, when they do the things that normal people do, they're not to be treated in the same way. And this is to be understood according to our Islamic teachings. They're not to be treated the same way you treat an average person or a normal person when they do something that we consider to be a violation, right? Of course, they have a greater burden on themselves too that they don't commit violations. Even the prophet's wives, the Quran threatens them. They say, you know, that if you do 
a sin, then Allah will multiply your, your punishment. He gives you twice the amount you give to other women. Ya Nisa and Nabi, let's tunna ka ahadim in Nisa. That you are not like any other woman. That the, so, so, because, because this is actually part of the debate. That some of the ulama say that, that the, this verse is all, also includes the Prophet's wives. But this event of the Yom al Kisa is well established. In other words, the point being here is that we have an obligation to have love for the, for the Ahlul Bayt. Uh, but also, it teaches us that Allah's favor comes to some and doesn't come to others. And I do think that this is a, something that many people struggle with in our times because we have this doctrine of radical equality. This idea that, well, nobody's better than anyone else. Everyone is the same. Everyone should be allowed to do the same things. But that's not the way it's been. For most of human history, not only with the Muslims, this is everybody, right? Uh, even if you reflect upon the founders of this country, the founders of this country didn't mean for every single citizen to participate in the political process. That wasn't their belief. They, didn't, they weren't trying to create a democracy, no. America is not a democracy, it's a republic, right? It's a republic, you know, so representative government, right? And again, we can talk about, you know, whether or not it's right or wrong, but we need to understand that human beings from most of our, most of history understood that some people have favor over others in the same way that, you know, some people are physically stronger than other people. Some people are taller than other people, right? That, that there's this, Allah didn't create everyone the same. He created those with the advantages to, to, to actually help those who don't have those advantages. That because it's, it's responsibility that comes with it. So, so that is uh, a, an important part of this. I do think we need to acknowledge that Allah favors some people over certain people. He's, he, favored, he favored people over other creatures that he's created, first and foremost. That the human being is the, uh, we would say, the master of this realm, we would say. Right? I mean, lions are afraid of human beings. Right? Of course, when they see us coming, of course, they, they, of course, they can kill us in any time, but they know right, that this creature walking on two legs, there's something special about that creature, and I better get away because they might, I might get hurt. Right? You know, or I better make sure I get the jump on them right? because there's something special about us, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's favored the human being over other creatures. But he's favored um, the Arabs over everyone else too. It may be difficult for some people to hear that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored the Arabs. And what, what, what did he do? He gave them, he sent among them the last and the best of the messengers. Rasulullah min anfusikum. Right, that he, he sent among them, and he sent, and he sent the, Arab, the Quran in the Arabic, tongue, the Arabic language, bilisan in Arabi and Mubin. He sent it in the Arabic language, right? Not in some other, other language. So that's, that's a part of being favored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes because of special merit that people have, certain qualities they have, other times it's just fadlullah, that Allah just say, hey, you know, it's just, just, just what it is and what it is. I just chosen those people. Maybe it has nothing to do with merit at all, right? But often it has to do with certain advantages and merit that those people have, right? And then among the Arabs, he favored the Quraysh. And from the Quraysh, he favored Banu Hashim. And from Banu Hashim, he favored al Bayt Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? So, so there is this doctrine, which is very much part of true Islam, that I think that many Muslims today struggle with because of everything that we're bombarded with. That, that some people are better than you. Some people, I'm not an Arab, but I can acknowledge, and I'm saying, this is not I just say that every, an Arab is better, in, in, inherently better than a non-Arab. No, we're not going there with that. We're just talking about that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he chooses collectives, he chooses individuals, right? And I do personally think that it is, it is really futile or it, though that it makes no sense that we find, for instance, to discover that someone who's a member of our race uh, was responsible for some great invention or some great thing that we all take pride in. You know, and so that's natural that we do so, but to try to measure the entire population or assume that this is innate to you, that it's a, a biological sort of 
you're wired differently. These particular people are wired differently than those other people. And so, so, so you're, you're great because that one person did that from your people did that great thing. So all of you are great. It happens to us, but I think that personally is not really useful. Now, again, moving up to speaking about the issue of the, of the, the murder, I also wanted to highlight that when we speak about these issues, especially um, when it relates to individuals who we learn in Islamic history are people of great stature, because these are conflicts being between people of great stature, that we have to understand first and foremost that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for, for a very good reason, he says in multiple verses in the Quran, tilka ummatun qad kharat. This is a generation that has already passed. It will have, or they will have what they earn, and they will receive the burden of what they have acquired and earned as well. And you will not be asked about what they used to do. And there's a tendency when we, especially when we think about the sectarian history in Islam, and this sectarian divide is a tendency to Talk about these things as if, you know, yeah, if I was alive during that time, I definitely would have been with Imam Hussein. Or if I was alive when the Prophet was there, I would have definitely followed the Prophet Or say when slavery existed in America, you know, yeah, I would have been on the side of the abolitionists. You don't know what, where you, have, you would have been. You only know that you live now, and alhamdulillah, you didn't have to be tried with those type of decisions. And so we can... 20 is a so, you know, you know, hindsight is 2020, is, is, or however the statement goes, right? You know, so, so we can moralize people, we can be very critical of them now, but we have to understand that, um, that, uh, that basically um, they were people, they were human beings, and human beings are subject to making mistakes. And when war happens, as, as the statement goes, the first casualty of war is, is truth. There were wars in Islamic history, right? And the very first conflagration, you know, was after the death of the Prophet ﷺ and after Abu Bakr Siddiq, he assumed leadership in the community. That there was what we call the Harub al-Ridda, the, the apostasy wars, they, they, they erupted uh, during the time of, of Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu But alhamdulillah, eventually, the conflict was quelled and during the reign of Umar ibn Khattab, there was relative peace, and then he was assassinated by a non-Muslim. Uh, and then uh, Imam, the Uthman ibn Affan reigned after him, and then Uthman was assassinated by a Muslim this time. And this is called the event, or the event that led to what we call the first civil war in Islamic history. The, 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 after the assassination of uh, assassination Uthman ibn Affan. And what we notice when we look close in Islamic history is that these wars, this was the first civil war, the second civil war is what happened uh, with Imam Hussein. But, but in these civil wars, we notice it that in each one of these civil wars, that the leaders or the main participants are of the same families. And so you have three, fundamental, three, three primary families involved in these wars. One is, family is what we call the family of the Alawids, Maybe the, 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 the relatives of uh, the progeny of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, the second is we call it the Zubayrids, the, the descendants of, of Zubayr ibn Awam, ibn Khuwaylid, uh, who was the husband of Asma bint Abi Bakr, but also the cousin of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the nephew of Khadija bin Khuwaylid. In other words, his father was the brother of Khadija, and his mother was the aunt of the Prophet ﷺ, his aunt Safiya bin Abdul Muttalib. Right? So Zubayr ibn Awam, right? he himself, and then his progeny, uh, and then thirdly were the, uh, the group of uh, the dynasty, which later became a dynasty we call the Banu Umayyah, the Umayyads. So the Alawis, the Zubayrs, and Umayyads. So, and the first war, 
between those three factions, the second war between also the descendants. So Abdullah ibn, ibn Zubair, the son of Ibn Zubair, he himself was one of the, um, it's hard to call them rebels because he never gave uh, allegiance to Yazid ibn Muawiyah, but the son of Muawiyah, the son of Abdullah ibn Zubair, and then the son of Imam Ali ibn Abi, ibn Abi Talib, an. So in warfare, the first casualty of war is truth, as we say. So for that reason, you'll find many things, you'll read many things about many people in these wars, and we have to understand that the Muslim scholars in Muslim history were, were very, was much, they were much less scrupulous when it came to embracing historical claims than they, than they were with respect to authenticating the, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu In other words, you'll find one book that'll say one thing happened and another book that'll say something else that happened and then you're sort of just left there to kind of pick and choose. Uh, and so, and, and that's one of the reasons that the scholars of Aqidah generally say that when we spoke, speak about the Sahaba especially, that we should try to uh, interpret things in the best way. You know, assign to them the best of intentions, right? And acknowledge that there's ishtihad. Some people had a ishtihad, others had a different ishtihad. At least for the Sunnis, this has been our, our position historically. And, and, and another thing we need to, I think is important to acknowledge too, is that regardless of what, where you land with respect to what happened with Imam Hussein, cursing dead people, cursing dead people does little, does little to gain Allah's satisfaction. In other words, you'll find people who say, you know what, I don't like Yazid, I'll curse Yazid, or I don't like Muawiyah, and I'll curse Muawiyah. Right? And as if by in doing so, it brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But more important is that even if, we, even if that did bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what guarantee do you have that Yazid or Muawiyah will not enter Jannah and you will? What guarantee did you have? How do you know that they'll go to hell or you and you and you won't go to the hell? Right. So that for, re for that reason, it really makes no sense for people to curse dead people in that sense. At any rate, as we it mentioned, we have the first civil war and the civil, second, second civil war. And so basically, this is what happened in the second civil war. Imam al-Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, the eldest grandson of the Prophet after the assassination of his father, Ali ibn Abi Talib, he himself was given allegiance by many of the elders of the Ummah at the time. They gave him allegiance and they, they appointed him or accepted him as the new Khalifa. And he ruled for about six months. Eventually, Muawiyah had approached Medina and he was ready to demand from Al Hassan allegiance to him because the dispute between himself and, 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 and Imam Hussein, Imam Hassan's father Ali, had not been really resolved other than to say that they accepted that one would rule one part of the Ummah and the other would rule the other part of the Ummah. And so now Imam Ali was gone. So Muawiyah felt, well, I, I, I'm the rightful ruler. Right? But people have given this bay'ah to Imam al-Hassan. So he comes to Imam al-Hassan with his army. Imam al-Hassan has his army. And Imam al-Hassan was a man of, of wisdom, of great wisdom. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, he said of Imam Hassan when he was alive, once the Prophet was speaking and, and Hassan, he was sitting, he was sitting on the uh, stage in front of the Prophet or in front of the Prophet as he was speaking on the, on the pulpit and, and he would look at Imam Hassan and then he would look at the people and then sometimes he'd look at Hassan and then he said, this son of mine is a leader. And Ibn Hadha Sayyidun that he is a leader, that he will unify two great armies, two great factions, right? And, um, and so Imam al-Hassan, he was said to be the most 
He was of the two sons, the two grandsons. He was the one who resembled the Prophet the most in his physical, well, I said from the, from the chest up to the head, that Imam Hassan resembled the Prophet more than any of his other family members. And as Hussein from the chest down, it resembled the Prophet the most. But Imam Hassan was said to resemble the Prophet also in his character, much more than Imam Hussein. Um, and uh, Imam, Imam Hassan, when he was, uh, he him, sometimes, sometimes he and Imam Hussein would wrestle. And one particular occasion, they were wrestling in front of the Prophet and Fatima was there. And, and the Prophet started to say, hey ya Hassan, hey ya Hassan, hey ya Hassan, which is basically means, uh, yeah, let's go, Hassan. Go, Hassan. Let's go, Hassan. And naturally, Fatima, being the mother of both of them, of course, she was confused. She said, well, why is my father only cheering for Hassan? Right? I know him to be a man who, of justice, a man of fear. You know, is he not concerned that this may not, you know, affect <laughs> the psyche of a Hussein? So she asked him, she said, well, why are you saying, hey, ya Hassan? And he said, I'm saying Hayya Hassan because Jibreel is saying Hayya Hussein. Jibreel is, is cheering him on. So he so said, go Hassan, go Hussein. So this was a competition between the Prophet and the angel. And of course, Fatima could not see the angel. And of she could hear, she hear him. Right. But Imam Hassan, what he does is, he decides that it was now time for the bloodshed to stop. Because there had been bloodshed from Omar being killed and then Uthman being assassinated. And then the civil war, the first civil war beginning, up to the point where his own father had been assassinated. So now he's in this position. He's the rightful leader of the Ummah. But realizes that Muawiyah is not going to back down. And if Muawiyah is not going to back down, say, so I'm not going to back down either. But what's better? For more Muslims to die? or for the Muslims to be unified. So Imam Hassan, he decides, I will surrender leadership, the Khilafah, over to you with multiple conditions. But one condition was that once you're finished with it, that you return it back to me. That was what he, one of the things he said to him. He also told him that, uh, what I also want to stop is for, what, for your Imams to stop cursing my father from the member. Right, at Jummah, because this was a, a practice. The, the, the followers of Imam Ali Ibn Abi thought it were cursing Muawiyah, then those who were following, who are following Muawiyah were cursing Imam Ali. But, but one of the things that Imam Hassan said was, return it to me when you're done. So Muawiyah accepts the terms. And this is called Amul Jama'ah, the year of unity, because this is when all the fighting stops. There was no more disputes. Everyone gave bay'ah to Muawiyah Ibn Abi Sufyan, and there was peace. Imam Hussein didn't like this. He actually was critical of Imam al Hassan because of this decision. He thought it was, bad, it was a bad decision. And there were others who actually referred to Imam Hassan, saying to him, Ya Musawwid al Mu'mineen, La Musawwid al al Mu'mineen, oh, you who has blackened the faces of the Muslims, right? You've, 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 you've delivered. Like catastrophe to us. This is what they saw, and he, and he Imam Hassan defended himself. So you don't know what I I know this matter better than you do. This I actually recorded this one of the things he said to Imam Hussein. Right. So, see, Imam Hussein wasn't. He didn't like it. Right. And many people didn't like it as well. But it did bring unity. The Muslims were no, no longer fighting. Unfortunately, before Muawiyah was finished with his reign, Imam Hussein, Imam Hassan dies. Now, you find different reports. Um, some say that he was poisoned by Muawiyah himself. Of course, a Sunni historian said, no, no such thing happens. Any reports about that are false. Most of them say, well, it was Yazid who poisoned him. How did he poison him? He poisoned him through a woman, his wife. Because remember, Hassan, he married a lot. Right? He got married quite a bit of time, not quite a number of times. Right? And so they took advantage of this. Uh, and sent to him a woman who um, gave him poison, put poison in his food for multiple months until eventually he died from it. Now, he learned that it was for her, and when on his deathbed, Imam Hussein was demanding from him, who did this to you? 
And he refused to tell her what he said. He said, no, he said, I will not tell you because he didn't want any, 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 any bloodshed. Do not take vengeance for me. Right? No bloodshed at all. So Muawiyah decides that after some prodding from people like Mughira bin Shu'bah and others, he decides that I'm going to turn, or when I die, I'm going to give this, turn this, turn this over to my son, Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Now, this itself was a problem for multiple reasons. One, because the Muslims had already seen a tradition develop. When the Prophet ﷺ, when he passed away, he appointed no one as his, as his successor. And when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was, was on his deathbed, he appointed Umar ibn Khattab. And Umar was not a relative of Abu Bakr, at least not a blood relative, right, in the way that we typically think of blood relatives. And when Umar was on his deathbed, instead of him appointing someone, he left it to Shura. He said he, he, he appealed to the elders, and the elders were 10 of the Sahaba who were the Prophet, وسلم, he passed away, and they were, he was pleased with them. Omar was one of them, Abu Bakr was one of them, Omar, Uthman, Ali, Sa Sa'id, uh, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Alf, they were, you know, Sa'id ibn Sa'id ibn, Sa ibn Abi Waqas, Sa'id ibn Zaid, that uh, Abu Ubaidah. They were the elders of the community. So the remaining elders, Omar said, you know, you decide. You decide with one exception. Sa Sa'id ibn Zaid is not, uh, cannot be nominated. Why? Because Sa'id ibn Zaid was Omar ibn Khattab's brother-in-law. So he said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're going to elect people, appoint people on the basis of merit. So this is, again, so this is one of the problems with Muawiyah's decision is that, you know, he's doing it based upon merit. Now, Ibn Khaldun says, okay, Muawiyah appointed Yazid because he noticed and realized that at this point in Islamic history, that the tribes would only accept the leadership of Ben Umayyah. Because remember, Amr al Jama'ah, there was fighting. I mean, you had Abu Bakr, you had Umar, you had Uthman, he was assassinated, then you had Ali, and there was a civil war. Right? With Muawiyah, no more civil war. Peace had come. And so Ibn Khaldun, his reading is that, oh, the reason that Muawiyah decided to do this is that uh, he wanted to ensure that, they, that unity continued, right? So, so he felt that no, the people, the elders, would not accept anyone other than Banu Umayyah to, to lead. And of course, he was wrong about this, as we, as we know. But he decides, and he tries to convince, convince a number of the Sahaba in Medina, like Abdullah bin Umar, Ibn Abbas and, and Ibn Zubair, that to get Ba'a to, that, to that, when I, you know, that when I am gone, that I want you to give allegiance to my son. And so it is stated that they didn't accept it at that time, even though there's one narration, strong narration said that Abdullah bin Umar, he gave Ba'a to Yazid after the death of Muawiyah, and that is related in Sahih sources. But but fundamentally, what the first problem with this was that, again, he's not being appointed on the basis of merit. Dawood and Sulaiman were kings and prophets, alayhim as salam, as we know. And the son, he, he inherited the kingdom from the father. But that was, there were prophets, and there was merit involved there. But this idea of like just simply giving someone control because they're, they're my son, that in itself was a problem for the early Muslims. So, so that was one of the problems. The other problem was that, and these were, some, some of them said to be rumors and others uh, seemed to have been confirmed with relationship to Yazid and Muawiyah, Ibn Muawiyah. In other words, Yazid wasn't the most pious of people, even before he assumed leadership. And they were concerned about this. There were rumors that he was a wine drinker. This is before he was, when he was younger, when he was in his younger years. But then some say after he became the, the Khalifa too, that he continued to drink wine. There are some who claim that no, no, these are all made up about him. So the, again, the reason I made the statement about like how the first casualty, casualty of war is the truth 
is, is, is to understand that though we may believe many of the things about Yazid, we don't know. We can't confirm that until Yom Qiyamah, right? What actually was his state? Right? And so I'm trying to give more than one reason to understand why the Sahaba had a problem with this, right? And why they didn't want to give him uh, allegiance. They talked about how he was very extravagant in his spending, that he had like um, harems, he had um, he, he had dogs, he had monkeys, he had all types of things. And, you know, some some accuse him of 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 adult of of of, of, of incest. There are a lot of things that he's been accused of, right? But Yazid and Muawiyah, this it was a problem. They said this man can't possibly lead our ummah. That he can't be our Amir al-Mu'minin, our commander of the faithful. And as a matter of fact, there's a story that's told about this where Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the Khalifa, he, he, was, he was in the presence of a, of a man and he started to speak about Yazid. And he called Yazid Amir al-Mu'mineen. And then Umar, he said, you call him Amir al-Mu'mineen? And then Umar, he said, take him away and go lash him. He, he lashed the man. <laughs> Uh, uh, multiple times because of this for calling Yazid Amir al Mu'minin. Right? So, so there definitely was a problem with Yazid in that particular regard. In other words, there was a concern for the moral integrity of a leader. Islam is concerned with politics too. It's not only concerned with this devotional act, it's concerned with politics. And, and the moral integrity of, of a leader is important, especially when you're trying to leave a, lead a believing nation. If we reflect upon the fact that in the U.S. Uh, there was a, an attempt to, or at least a stated aim, goal is to have a, maintain a separation between church and state. There was never, in a, it, it, well, at least among the founding fathers, there wasn't an attempt to maintain a separation between the state and God. Because the founding documents have God in there. You know? In other words, when you believe that a political order is useful and is beneficial and it is ideal even, then you have to discriminate to an extent. You have to, you have to like, you can't just let anybody hold public office, right? So this is, you understand, this is that, that type of thinking, pre-modern thinking, old world type of thinking. This is where, where it comes from. Today we have, you know, kind of affected by some other things. So in other words, what happens now is that once Yazid, he assumes his role as Khalifa, word reaches him that these men in Medina, who were important elders, had not accepted their, his father's plea to actually give him allegiance. They didn't give him bear. So he sent someone to Medina to let them know that my father has passed away, I am now the Khalifa, I ask for you to come out publicly, let the people know that you, have to, you, you declare your allegiance to me. Now among the people he was concerned with were Hussein and Abdullah ibn Zubair. And so what they do, they heard that, that someone was coming, both of them head to Mecca. They leave, they, they leave Medina, they go straight to Mecca. Because you don't want, listen, you, you're not gonna pressure me to give you bayah. While in Mecca, the people of Kufa, word reaches them eventually that, oh, Imam Hussein refuses to give bayah to Yazid ibn Muawiyah. So they start to send him letters, the leaders there in Kufa. Hey, come to Kufa. We don't like our governor anymore. We believe that if you come, that you will unite us. And hundreds and hundreds of letters start to come in. And letters from the, the, the leaders start to come in to Kufa, uh, from Kufa to, to Mecca, where they knew that Imam Hussein was residing. Imam Hussein had received word that, um, that someone was out to assassinate him as well. So even before he made the decision that he was gonna to go to Kufa, he sent his cousin, Musa ibn Aqil ibn Abi Talib, he sent him to Kufa to confirm that all of these letters were authentic, to confirm that all these people truly were going to support him. And you have anywhere between 18 to 30,000 people who are saying, hey, we will support you, we will fight with you against uh, Yazid and his armies. 
Yazid had appointed over Kufa a man uh, known as Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. And Abdullah ibn Ziyad, he eventually re you know, received news of this as well, that there are these correspondences. And so he decides to send an army to Kufa. This is before Ibn Zubair, uh, before, before Imam Hussein comes. And uh, he places uh, at the, the leadership of that army uh, Umar ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. So again, Umar, these are, it's like, a lot of these are family feuds in a sense, right? Umar ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, we know Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas from the 10 promised Jannah, right? One of the elders of the community. His son is now, is actually working with Yazid ibn Muawiyah, but now he's a commander of this army. He sends him to, to Kufa. And there was a car, so, so Imam Hussein, okay, he's Musa, he's there in Kufa. Eventually, they, they find out that he's there, he's captured. Musa is captured, then eventually he's killed because they interpret this as rebellion. The Imam Hussein had already decided by this time to make his way to Kufa. Some say it's because, again, he heard the threats on his life and others because he, he, he trusted the news now by this time that these people, they're going to support him. That I should have an army now. So he's on his way, but he never gets the news that Musa, or he doesn't get the news in time, that Musa had already been captured and been killed. He arrives eventually, and then when, he, when he's there, he starts to correspond to, with Sa'd, with Umar bin Sa'd, the commander of the army. And so Omar, they're trying to negotiate terms and things like that. And, but eventually what happens is that uh, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he sends another man, name is, name is Shimr, uh, ibn Dil uh, ibn Dil Joshan. He sends him to Kufa because Ubaidullah felt that, okay, was too much time is going by and nothing's happening. Not, nobody, they haven't sent word that they've given bay'ah yet. So he sends. Shimr. Shimr comes to Saad and he says to him, I've been sent to you to, to expedite this process. And I've been told if, you're, if you have a problem, then I can take your place. But Saad says, okay, no, no, no. I can handle this. So eventually they demand from Imam Hussein that he surrender, they give bay'ah or who surrender. Eventually, he decides, no, it's not going to happen. And fighting erupts. Fighting erupts. Unfortunately, Imam Hussein is abandoned by the people of Kufa. Once they heard about the execution of Musa ibn Aqil, it frightened them. Say, no, no, no. Yeah, we were ready to defend Hussein, but now they're seeing the results of actually taking part in a rebellion, so to speak, what could happen? So they became cowards and they abandoned Imam Hussein. And Imam Hussein, his, his troops and his family started to fall until eventually uh, he was overpowered. Now, according to some versions of history, he, he said that he, he, had, he will surrender, that he was ready to surrender and to give bay'ah to Yazid. Take me to Yazid and I'll put my hand in his hand and I'll give him bay'ah. That is some accounts. Another, other accounts say he didn't do that at all. But at any rate, you know, we have that out there. It's there. Right? Imam Hussein, regardless of anything, what happened was that reconciliation at that point was not allowed. He was not given an opportunity. And the men, and they said there are three men in particular. There was um, Shamar, and there's another man, Sinan ibn Anas, and Nakhai, and a Khawli. Uh, I forget his, Asbahi, Khawli Asbahi. The three of them, they had overpowered Imam Hussein. One of them had stabbed him with a spear. Khawri, he moved to, after Imam Hussein, his, his life was taken and they were certain that he was dead. Khawri was ordered to 
remove his head. And he slaughtered, cut his head off. And he tried to, but then one of the others finished it. Says Shimmer finished it. And there are different reports about it. Shimmer did it, Chodi did it, Sinan did it. But at any rate, all of them under the command of Abdullah ibn Ziyad, who was under the command of Yazid ibn Mu'awi. So they not only behead Imam Hussein, they behead about 72 of his followers. And all of their heads are sent to Damascus to Yazid. Uh, Ubaidullah um, Wasad, he had left the head of Hussein with Sinan, and Sinan took it to his home and, and he hid it under a pot. And then he went to his wife and started to celebrate. He said, you know, I brought you a great gift. I have the head of Imam Hussein. And she was outraged herself. This woman was outraged. She said, seriously, men usually come home and they bring gifts of candy and of jewels and other things like that to their wives. And you tell me, you came to bring me the head of the son of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa she said that we, would never, we could never share a bed from this day on. And so she went back home to her parents. Right? She left, right? Um, but eventually they bring his head, deliver it to Yazid on, we could say, a platter. Um, it is related that one, one man was, had a stick and he was poking this, the head of Hussein in his lips. And the Sahabi, Zayd ibn Arqam, was, was present. He was an old man. And he said, by Allah, I saw the lips, the lips of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kiss those lips many times. In other words, they say, shame on you. Shame on you. And then the response he got is, if you weren't old, I would behead you now as well. Right? But this was the state of the Ummah unfortunately, at that time. So Imam Hussein, his life was taken unjustly. Was he trying to surrender? Perhaps. Even if he wasn't, did he deserve this type of treatment? No, he didn't deserve this treatment. This is a point of ijma between all of the Muslims that he did not deserve such treatment. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, Al-Hasan wal Hussein, Rayhan ataya min dunya That Hassan and Hussein, they are my two sweet basils in this, in this world. And as I stated, Hussein wa minni wa ana min Hussein. I am, Hussein is from me, he's part of me, and I am part of Hussein. Ahabba Allahu man ahabba Husseinan. Allah loves anyone who loves Hussein. Allah loves anyone who loves Hussein. And he also said, Al Hassan wa Hussein wa Sayyida Shababi Ahl Jannah. That Al Hassan and Hussein, they are the, 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 the best young, young people among the people of Jannah. They're the best of them. And after Imam Hussein was killed, Yazid, he didn't stop. He continued and he still demanded bay'ah from the people of Medina. And that in itself is a to total other story itself. Till the event called al Harra happened when many Sahaba were killed in this. So, so Yazid definitely was guilty of many, many different things, horrible things. But I would say to, to, to conclude with some lessons, I would say, that we can take from this, is that despite the fact, despite the fact that the position of Ahlul Sunnah is that you don't rebel against your, your leaders, that we also hold that when people are in a position to overthrow 
meaning they have the capacity to do so, that they pose a major threat to the incumbent, then it is permissible to do so. Anything that will mitigate the fitna. And when Ahl Sunnah talks about not being able to rebel, what this means is that as long as it doesn't lead to a greater evil, that when we are fearful that a greater, greater evil will happen, like we see happen, for instance, during the Arab Spring and the, the great refugee crisis, or we see things like happen in Ukraine, like right now, things like that, and the great loss of life, because two people or two factions, they are vying for power, um, then that is the only reason that the Sunnis held this position. So when we look at Imam Hussein and Abdullah ibn Zubair and the others who actually, uh, they did not give bear to, Imam, to, 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 to Yazid, that they remind us of a fact of, of something which is that tyranny should never be left unchallenged. Even if you, the only thing you can do is say something about it, as the Prophet taught us. If you can change it with your hand, change it. If you can change it, can't change it with your hand, then, then you say something about it. It should never be left unchallenged. No one should be given absolute power. And as Lord Acton said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Right? So no one should have absolute power. No one party in any system, democratic system, should have full, complete power of every um, office of government. And it also teaches us, teaches us as well that our success in this life is not only connected to the individual acts that we do, the acts of devotion, our prayers, our fasts, etc. But success also is connected with the state or the good state of our leaders. <clears throat> that it, 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 it is important that people who hold public office believe in God. It's even more important that they believe in Islam. And I don't want people, I don't mean people who, who just simply look Muslim, but people who actually believe in Islamic mores. And they believe that those mores will improve society. And they are not afraid to promote that in, their, in, this, in society. Muslim, no Muslim should be afraid to, 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 to promote or discourage promiscuity, to discourage the use of drugs, to, to discourage uh, um, uh, murder and all types of other things that happen in society. We should not be afraid to do that. We shouldn't just say, oh, this is a secular society, it's not Muslim, it's society, and people can do whatever they want. No, we shouldn't take that attitude because when they get out of line, when they go too far, when a lost punishment comes, it's not only going to afflict them, it's going to afflict all of us. And he warns us about this in the Quran. Said, be on guard against a tribulation which would not afflict only those who are wrongdoers. Be on guard against that. Be on guard against it that we, that it should be a reminder of this, that the state of the the, the, the faith and the morality of our leaders is important. And if we see people who are immoral, then of course we don't support them. We should not support them. It's a reminder as well that it's already stated that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he favors some people and he doesn't favor others. And one thing, one thing that was distinct about being favored in this pre-modern world was that to be from Ahlul Bayt, it didn't mean that you are the ones who are showered with the most gifts. If anything, it meant the opposite. Because remember the Prophet Sallallahu he didn't take from the Sadaqah. The Prophet Sallallahu uh, um, he, he barely even ate, he hardly ate meat. It wasn't a regular thing for him to eat meat. That, that, that there would be days or perhaps months at, at times where they never even um, heat up a pot in the, in the home to cook anything that he generally he ate dates and he drank water and he had bread, uh, that he didn't get a lot of sleep, he prayed at night, that also was one of the obligations of Ahlul Bayt, that the Prophet used to go around, go out at night and check people's homes and he would go and check the home of Fatima and Ali to make sure that they were praying to Hajjah. 
Other Sahaba, it's like, well, okay. You can if you want. But then, no, you have to pray to Hajj. We are Ahlul Bayj. We pray to Hajj. He made sure of that. Aisha Rajalan, how the Prophet would pray to Hajj, she would be sleeping right in front of him. And when he prostrated, she would move her legs out the way. And then when he stood up again, she put her legs right back out. The Prophet at no one point said, Aisha, Aisha got up and prayed to Hajj. No, because she's not Ahlul Bayj. But Fatima and Ali, Ahlul Bayj. Right? Women who are Ahlul Bayj, their, their freedom was restricted. They didn't have more freedom because they were special. No, they had less freedom because you have to be protected. Because you protect things that are valuable. Right? This was that old, old world thinking, that pre-modern thinking. And then, again, finally, uh, we have this obligation. Right? Being given this obligation to love the Messenger والسلام, and also to love his children, the members of his house, household. And um, so again, Yom Ashura in the life of the Prophet وسلم, it was a day of gratitude, but also we know it's a day of sadness. And the reason it's a day of sadness is because of what happened in Karbala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our predecessors. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he grant us the capacity to fill their shoes, all of those who are righteous. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place within us the, the, the love of Ahlul Bayt and the love of his companions and to remove from us any rancor for the Prophet's companions and for any Muslim, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That's right, yeah, sorry. So, um, any questions, comments? <laughs> Nothing at all is fine, too. <laughs> no, we have one question from Bismillah. online, actually. Yes. I'll start with that. Bismillah. Mm -hmm. So, did Hussein Razilatana know about his fate when he marched to Kufa? Did Prophet tell him about that? There's a narration that mentions that um, one of the reasons that Imam Hussein, Hussein didn't take the advice of many of the Sahaba who discouraged him from going um, was because of the dream that he had where he saw the Prophet Because um, he was going to go and Abdullah ibn Zubair was encouraging him, said, yeah, you should go, I'm going to rebel, you should rebel too. But Abdullah ibn Abbas, Ibn Umar, Jabir ibn Abdullah, um, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, a number of Sahaba said, no, you shouldn't go. Don't go, Hussein. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave your, your grandfather a choice between the dunya and akhirah, and he, and he chose the akhirah. They saw this as seeking dunya, right? But he said, you know, I had a dream. The Prophet وسلم, he told me something that I need to fulfill. And I'm going to fulfill what I've been commanded by the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. So there is a narration that, that mentions this, that, uh, and perhaps this is one of the reasons why he just felt he could not take the advice that he could he, he couldn't even take the advice of his brother his brother said don't sort of seek don't seek my vengeance against uh, on my behalf or or, or seek uh, to cause greater fitna uh, in the ummah right but but fundamentally there is a narration so but it's not clear exactly what that dream entailed but it's I do I have read the narration that says that he said the prophet he commanded me something and I'm going to do what he commanded right but exactly what that was we don't know Any other questions? No. Yeah, and there's a, yeah, there's a difference of opinion among the scholars about who, uh, who are included among Ahl al-Bayt. Um, the verse in Surah Al-Hazab, the context is the prophet's wives it's very clear the, the verse that mentioned we rarely we intend to or we desire to remove from you all impurities and to purify you completely oh members of the household um that's actually in the context of the prophet's wives right yeah uh, so the verses before it are, are, are a reference to the prophet's wives the verses after it are a reference to the prophet's wives and for that reason there are a number of scholars who say that the prophet's wives are included um and then we add on top of that the 
there's the verse, I forget what surah, what surah is in, when um, the angel visits Ibrahim alayhi salam and he informs him that his wife Sarah alayhi uh, salam that she's going to give birth and she's she's dumbfounded because she's in an advanced old age and so and then the angel says you know, are you amazed uh, about uh, Allah's command Allah's affair right? Majid, that you know that mercy and blessing be upon you all oh, members of the house household in other words the angels are re responding to Sarah and Sarah is his wife right um, and so it would seem that wives are included among the meaning of Ahl bayt however there's a narration that wherein well this incident of we call it the day of Kisa and this is the incident when the Prophet وسلم, he took this cloak and he wrapped himself and Hassan Hussein Fatima and Ali in that cloak and then recited the verse. Uh, um Salama was there, witnessed this, and she asked, she asked Ya Rasulullah, am I included as well? And he told her that she wasn't right, included uh, in that meaning. Right? So there is some conflict in the reporting. Right? So it's not totally clear, but throughout Muslim history, it seems that most of the ulama have inclined in this direction that the Ahl al-Bayt are um, those five, the prophet and uh, the mother, father, and the two grandsons, right? That they are the Ahl al-Bayt and then the progeny, their progeny. There's some today who actually say it's only them, it's not, it doesn't go beyond them. But um, yeah, there's, some, there's a dis disagreement about it, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Use the mic, yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum. Uh, Alaykum. That's another question. Uh, mm. Perhaps I wasn't was listening well, but mm. I just want to make sure on how do we understand in more detail, perhaps, the idea of Yazid getting in. Was it just because uh, Muhammad was uh, uh, liking to his son that he got into the Khalifa, or what was the bigger reason behind this? Well, yeah, well, what we do know for a fact is that Muawiyah chose his son to be his successor. We know that. Uh, the reason, reasons why, we don't know for certain, right? Other than that it's stated that, like I mentioned, for instance, Ibn Khaldun's reading is that it was because he realized that the people would only accept the rule of the Umayyads, right? And there could be some truth to that, had it not been for the fact that Hussein and Ibn Zubair actually came out against them, right? Maybe if they had not done so, then there would have not been any conflict. But, um, uh, but he, he appointed him, right? Um, and, but then also Ibn Khaldun says, uh, Muawiyah cannot be held accountable for um, the impiety of his son, right? As well, right? Because he claims, uh, Ibn Khaldun claims that uh, those, I, those factors had not yet appeared when Muawiyah was alive, right? So he was appointing someone who by all intents and purposes was a pious person, right? You know, and there are multiple reports of people defending Yazid as well against all of the accusations. You know, some even claim that he was a pious person as opposed to being an impious person. So that, so that makes it difficult to really know exactly like what the real issue was, like why uh, they felt that they could not, uh, uh, they could not give him allegiance. You know, but that, did that answer your question? Yes, JazakAllah okay. khairan. Jazakallah khair. Any sisters? Yes. Um, no. No, she was the youngest daughter. No, no, Fatima, again, as far as I recall, that she was the, the youngest of the four daughters, right? And, um, and all his other children had passed away before he had, um, she was the only of one of his children who had outlived him. And she died six months after the Prophet's death, alayhi salatu wasalam. Um, and, and after that is when Ali had um, married other women, right? So, so while she was alive, she was the only wife, right? But once she had passed away, he married, um, you know, other, other, other wives yes, and had children from them, yeah.
Yeah, well, the prophet had married his other daughters to other people, right? Because, like, cause was, right. Well, Uthman was married to two of his daughters. Uthman ibn Affan, you know, he married, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I understand where you're going with it. I don't know. I don't know why exactly it happened that way, but I, maybe it, it's just that suitors, other suitors had come earlier. They beat him to the punch, as we would say. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so the only one was left was Fatima. Once she became, she was old enough to be married. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, the... Uh, the, the, well, there's Muhsin as well. There's, there's uh, Hassan. When, when, he, when Fatima and Ali had given birth to Imam Hassan, Imam Ali wanted to name him Harb. And Harb is war. He wanted to name him warfare. And then the Prophet, now. Uh, yeah, now there, yeah, some of his other daughters did have children, but they died in, 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 they were in their youth. Right? I know Ruqayya, I, th I believe she had one or two children, and they, but they died when they were young. Right, so yeah, but the only ones who survived were the Hassan Hussein, right? And and Muhsin, I can't remember exactly what happened with him. Muhsin was the third of the children between Fatima and and uh, and, um, and Ali, right? Yeah, but I, the story I was telling him was that Imam Ali wanted to call him, name him War, and the Prophet said, no, his name is not War, his name is Hassan. And then Hussein was was born, and he wanted to name him War again, Harb, and he said, no, his name is Hussein. And then Muhsin was born, and say his name is Harb. Right, so the prophet said, no, his name is Mursin. Right? So, and he said, yeah, and he said that um, I named him after the, 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 the children of Harun, right, of the prophet, the, the brother of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, uh, because the translation of their three names are the same names as uh, Hassan, Hussein, and Mursin. You know, as uh, I believe it's Shibr, Shibir, and Mubashir, those three. Uh, so the prophet, it doesn't in the hadith, he said, I named them after those names. And no one prior to them were given those names, right? You know, it said that their names were from the, the names of the people of heaven, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent those names down so that the prophet so said, would give them to his, to his grandsons. Hmm. Yeah. Get weird. All right. Barakallahu feekum wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. And so I believe uh, 